É com uma, um grande prazer, uma honra, que eu convido o Robert Whittaker para fazer a conferência de abertura do nosso evento. O Robert é, é, é estadunidense, é um jornalista investigativo e que tem se dedicado a fazer uma análise científica de, de pesquisas e publicações no campo da medicina, mais especificamente no campo da psiquiatria e da neurologia. É, o Robert tem alguns livros bastante importantes nesse campo, de desmistificar muito o que se diz como sendo ciência no campo da psiquiatria, e ele tem é, feito esse trabalho de desconstrução de inverdades divulgadas como ciência. Ele tem alguns livros publicados, tem vários textos, tem um, um site do Robert em que são disponibilizados vários textos dele, vários prêmios já ganhos por seu trabalho, e o, o livro, ele tem dois livros que são especialmente importantes para nós, o Médio em América e o Anatomy of Epidemics, que está sendo traduzido pela editora da Fiocruz. Né? Estávamos programados para fazer o arremesso do livro Anatomia de uma Epidemia aqui nesse evento, mas houve um problema com a editora e não ficou pronto. Mas em breve será lançado no Brasil e aí a gente vai estar divulgando também. Então é um prazer bastante grande, Robert. O Robert vai fazer uma fala um pouco mais longa, porque nós pedimos a ele que usasse o tempo necessário para fazer toda essa discussão e essa desconstrução de várias coisas que são constantemente divulgadas, como sendo uma, práticas baseadas em evidências científicas. Né? Então, ele tem o tempo necessário que for para falar. Você sinta-se à vontade, o dia é seu. Bom, bueno, uh... Yo voy a decir algunas palabras en, en, en español, pero no puedo hablar portugués y lo siento por eso. Y quiero decir, es un honor, un honor estar aquí y un muy gracias a sí de su organización para esta invitación. Pero yo voy a hablar en inglés y ustedes pueden, hay una persona que va a traducir mis palabras, ¿ok? Y lo siento que no puedo hablar portugués, pero uno, ¿ok? Ainda? Todo bem. Bueno. Bueno. Eh, eu vou... Uh, now, in English. So, uh, if we look at the medicating of children in a society, we began to do it in the United States really in about 1980. That was the year the American Psychiatric Association, for the first time, uh, made a diagnosis called ADHD. Before 1980, there was no such diagnosis, but at that time they had it for the first time, and we began to prescribe Ritalin to our children, starting at about age five and on up. And today we have about 13% of our children diagnosed with ADHD. And then we began to use antidepressants in the middle 1990s with our children. And then finally, we had some new antipsychotic drugs uh, called atypical antipsychotics. And in particular, we began to prescribe those drugs to our poor children uh, with the idea it would help them behave. And particularly, children we call foster care children, children who are no longer living with their families but are under the, the care of the state. We began using the antipsychotics on those children. And today, about by the time our children reach 18 years of age in the United States, about one in five children is now taking a psychiatric medication. Uh, if you look at some of the universities, about 
uh, 30% of the children, 25 to 30% of the children, uh, by the time they come to the university are taking a psychiatric medication. So you can see the pathologizing of American children is proceeding at great pace. Now initially when this began to happen in the United States, uh, there were psychiatrists and, other, and psychologists and social workers in other countries in Europe, South America, they looked at what was happening in the United States and they thought, ah, oh, those crazy Americans, it will never happen in our country. It's just those crazy Americans that are diagnosing their kids with ADHD and using antidepressants. But the United States is an influential country, it's a big country, and what happened was this. Every year the American Psychiatric Association would have a, a, an annual conference and they would bring the, the pharmaceutical companies would fly psychiatrists from all over the world to that meeting, and there they would learn about ADHD, using antidepressants, that sort of thing. By the way, when the psychiatrists from other countries came to the United States for this, these meetings, the pharmaceutical companies would pay for their trips. And that was the way we exported these ideas and this form of care to basically around the world. We did it in Europe, we did it in South America, and I've been traveling quite a bit now in the last five years, and especially now in the last year, and everywhere I go, they are now diagnosing their kids with ADHD. Do you call it ADHD here? Uh, bueno. In other words, it's, it's, it's becoming universal. ¿Cómo se llama? A-T-D-A-H. D-A-H. In Espanol, it's te da a eche, eche, si, bueno. And so, uh, here's what I'd like to do today, and here's what I did in this book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. I asked a question that I think is very important. Since we're giving our kids these medicines, is it helping them grow up and thrive? In other words, do we have evidence, scientific evidence, that this practice is helping our children or not? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just look at when we, look, when we did scientific investigations of that question, what were the results? Over longer periods of time, for example, do stimulants help children do better in school, do better in life after two, five, ten years? Same with antidepressants and antipsychotics. And so we'll try in the next 90 minutes to look through these three classes of drugs. I have a question. In Brazil, are you using antidepressants to, to children? Are you prescribing antidepressants? Okay. And I bet you're using antipsychotics for kids diagnosed with autism, that sort of thing? Muto. Okay. These, this is relevant then to this audience, these three. The first thing I think it's important to know is how the drugs affect the brain. You may have heard that the drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain. Have you all heard that? That idea that there's something wrong with the chemistry of a child and the drugs fix that chemistry? You've heard that, right? It's not a scientific statement. It's a statement made to make the drugs look good, and, 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 and it's really a marketing statement. When they actually looked to see if people with depression had low serotonin, they did not find it to be so. Sometimes we hear that children with ADHD have too little dopamine, and then they take uh, Ritalin, and it fixes this problem of too little dopamine. That's not true either. They did not find that children with ADHD, TD, ah, have any problem with their, their chemistry in their brain, okay? They just did not find that. It's just a slogan used to sell the medications. So then we have to ask this question, how do the medications act on the brain, and then how, does, how is the brain changed by those medications? Because in fact, when you go on these medications, it will change the child's brain, and possibly forever, even after you come off. Now, how do neurons communicate in the, in the brain? How does one neuron act on a second neuron? You have a presynaptic neuron, we call it, which releases that molecule into the tiny gap between neurons. Hold. 
Me hace falta dos manos. <laughs> you have a presynaptic. Oh, yeah, lo siento. Okay. No, 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 está bien. No, está bien. Está bien. No, está bien. Okay. Okay. You have a presynaptic neuron which releases that molecule, a chemical messenger like serotonin, into the tiny gap between neurons, which we call the synaptic cleft. And then that molecule binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. We say that molecule fits into the receptors like a key into a lock. And when that happens, that passes a, a message from the first neuron to the second neuron. Now the final part of this messaging system is when that molecule goes to that tiny gap, you now have to remove it from that gap to end the message. And you do that in one of two ways. Either the molecule goes back in, up into the first neuron, or an enzyme comes along and metabolizes that molecule, and those metabolites are carted off as waste. OK? That's the normal way that neurons communicate. And what drugs do, psychiatric drugs do, is they disrupt, they perturb that normal functioning, OK? And they do it in various ways. What antipsychotics do is they block the receptors for dopamine. And it's like pouring glue into the lock, pouring glue into those receptors. And so because of that, the dopaminergic pathways are subdued. They don't act in a normal way. They're tranquilized, OK? What does Ritalin do? What Ritalin does is it blocks the reuptake of dopamine from that gap into the first neuron. So now dopamine stays longer in that tiny gap, OK? It ups dopaminergic activity. By the way, Ritalin acts in the exact same way that cocaine does, exactly. The only difference between Ritalin and cocaine is Ritalin takes longer to clear the body. Ritalin is long-lasting cocaine, OK? Now, because your brain is so neuroplastic, when you take one of these medications, that whether you be a child or an adult, your brain is now going to try to compensate for the presence of this drug. So for example, if you take an antipsychotic, which is blocking those dopamine receptors, your brain is going to try to uh, maintain its normal functioning, and it's going to do that in two ways. The presynaptic neurons will put out more dopamine than normal, and the receiving neurons will increase their number of receptors for dopamine, okay? So think about it this way. If a drug acts to block uh, transmission of messages, say dopamine messages, your brain's going to go through adaptations that try to accelerate the transmission of those messages. So what happens when a child goes on Ritalin? Ritalin ups dopamine activity, right? Acts as an accelerator. So your brain now is going to put down the uh, break on dopamine activity, and it will do it in one of two ways. The presynaptic neurons will put out less dopamine than normal, and the postsynaptic neurons will decrease their number of receptors for dopamine, OK? Now, there is some evidence that after a while, if you've been on Ritalin for a while, even if you come off of it, it will not change back, OK? So if you give a child Ritalin for a couple years, you're going to change that dopaminergic system, and ultimately, you're going to drive it into a subsensitive state, OK? which is to say this is a profound thing to do. You're going to change this child's brain. Now, this uh, article here was written by Stephen Hyman in 1996. And he was director of our top agency for studying mental health problems. And if you, he wrote an article on a paradigm for understanding how psychotropic drugs work. And what he says is this. All these drugs perturb normal function. Your brain's now going to go through these adaptations to try to maintain a normal functioning. This is going to cause changes in how your genes express proteins. And look at the final line. At the end of this process, your brain is operating in a manner that is both qualitatively and quantitatively different than normal. 
So here's why this is important. We think these drugs are normalizing something wrong in the brain, right? In fact, we don't know if there's anything wrong in the brain, but after you take the drugs, your brain will be operating in an abnormal manner, okay? Does that make sense? I hope the tra translation is good. <laughs> okay, good. So we've sort of already been this, but if so we were just talking, if you take Ritalin, if you give Ritalin to a child, Ritalin ups dopaminergic activity, so what is your brain gonna do? It's going to uh, knock down its dopaminergic activity. Neurons are gonna release less dopamine. In rats, for example, if you give a rat dopamine, um, a, a Ritalin, uh, after a few months, it only has about half the amount of dopamine in its brain as is normal, okay? And then you're also on those receiving neurons, you're gonna have less receptors for dopamine, okay? So you can see it's a, um, and it, it actually will act on other molecules as well. Now we really don't know, once you go on these medications and then you come off, if it is reversible. In other words, you take Ritalin for a couple years, you stop taking the medication, does this density, does the number of receptors of your dopamine neurons, does it renormalize? We don't know, okay? We really don't. But in rats, in, in experiments with rats, they would give rats Ritalin for just two weeks. Then they'd stop the Ritalin, they'd let those rats go up to be adult rats, and then they'd sacrifice those rats, and they had abnormal dopamine systems. They did not have a normal number of dopamine receptors. Now the reason this is worrisome, and again, I want to emphasize this, we do not know what is happening in, in, in humans, really. But one worry is this, the dopamine system is a system that makes us curious, that makes us feel joy in life, okay? And the worry is that if you do this, you're damaging the dopamine system, and that when these children grow up and become adults, they're going to be more anxious, more depressed, and less curiosity-seeking than normal. That's what happens to the rats. The rats, as adult rats, are anxious, depressed, they don't interact with other rats, and, uh, and they just, and they're not curious seeking rats. So that's the worry from the animal studies, and we'll come back. So, in the, the United States, and now increasingly in the medical establishment around the world, they say this, we need our treatments to be evidence-based. In other words, there needs to be scientific evidence that supports what we're doing, and shows that it's helpful to people, okay? That's the idea, and this idea really took hold about 20 years ago. You have to have scientific evidence for your treatments, otherwise you may be doing harm, okay? This is the idea. So now we want to ask ourselves, does this change in the brain that we see when we give a child Ritalin, or we give a child an antidepressant, or we give a child an antipsychotic, does the evidence show that over longer periods of time, this is helping those children, okay? Or is there more benefit than risk? All right, and that's what we'll look at now. Now, if you give a child a stimulant, what happens to that child pretty quickly? Well, they will begin moving around less. So the symptoms that are used to diagnose ADHD are that the kids are doing things like this, or they're moving too much. These are the symptoms of the disorder. It's literally you're moving too much and you're disrupting the classroom and you may be talking too much and maybe you're not paying enough attention, but literally it is things like this, taps fingers too much, fidgets in seat, things like that. Now if you give a kid a stimulant, they will move around less, okay? And they will also talk less, they socialize less. So that is seen in terms of the symptoms of the disorder, an improvement. Okay, they're moving around less and they're talking less, which means they're disrupting the classroom less. And you'll see this, in 1995, our National Institute of Mental Health, which is our major organization for studying evidence-based mental health questions, they said, this is what the stimulants do. They reduce finger tapping, dizziness, movement, 
and classroom disturbance, okay? This is seen as evidence of, the, of effectiveness of the drugs, okay? But now you have to ask, that's sort of a medical measurement. Now let's look at what's happening in sort of a psychological way with the kids in the classroom. And going back to the 70s, you'll see what? They play alone more. They don't, inter they don't have as many social interactions. They're less curious. A child loses his sparkle. I hope that can be translated, okay? Loses his sparkle. Uh, they become passive, submissive, socially withdrawn. And then finally, the Oxford Textbook of Clinical Psychology summed up this change in this way. Stimulants reduce uh, the number of behavioral responses to the world. You become less sort of responsive to your world. Now you have to ask, is that good? That's a different way of looking at that. Is this good for the child, okay? This is the medical evidence. This is a psychological description of what is happening to the children, okay? And now how about the second thing? One of the ideas is your child will do better in school if you take Ritalin, right? And what they found, going back to the 70s and early 80s, is it may help you focus on certain tasks, repetitive tasks, maybe like doing your arithmetic. But if you look at tasks like problem solving and general learning, it does not seem to help. It does not produce any benefit on vocabulary, spelling, reading. Okay, and it actually says the reactions of the ch children strongly suggest a reduction in the commitment that is necessary to really learn. And then finally this. The major effect of stimulants appears to be an improvement in classroom manageability. In other words, the kid's behavior is more pleasing to the teacher than academic performance, okay? That was the early observations in the United States about how stimulants affected children. Then the next question is, these are shorter term uh, changes. Then people began to say, well, how about if we follow these kids for five and 10 years? Are we finding that it's really producing a benefit? And in 1994, the American Psychiatric Association, their textbook of psychiatry, psychiatry, summarized what had been learned up to that time. And up to that time, we'd been medicating our kids really more than 14 years, but at least 14 years. They said, we do not have any evidence that the medicating of kids produces lasting benefit on any domain of functioning, okay? Doesn't reduce aggressivity, criminality, education, doesn't improve education achievement, job functionings, no benefit, okay? That's what they said in 1994. So because there was no benefit, or no evidence of any benefit, the NIMH mounted a long-term study of ADHD children. And this study, when they mounted it, they said this, this is the investigation that is going to give us the evidence of whether or not these medications help children over the long term, okay? This is going to be the study that tells us as a society whether this is a good thing to do, okay? And you can see they call it the first uh, major clinical trial, and you'll see they say up to this time we have no evidence of long-term benefit, okay? The study was designed like this. Kids were either randomized into uh, behavioral therapy or into um, uh, medication plus behavioral therapy, medication given by experts in ADHD, and medication given by people in the community. Those were the four groups, okay? So one of the three groups, four groups, did not get drug. Now, at the end of 14 months, there was a report or some evidence that the children who were given medication by the experts, okay, not by the doctors in the community, but by the experts, were doing better. They had a greater reduction of their ADHD symptoms, and it looked like maybe they were doing a little better on reading as well, okay? And this result then was then promoted as finally we have evidence that the long-term use of stimulants is beneficial for children. And this is the evidence when your doctors, when your psychiatrists go to the United States, 
and they go to conferences, this is what they'll hear. We have evidence that the drugs are beneficial at the end of 14 months. You can go on the internet, and you, and you can go to, for example, the, a site run by the uh, Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the United States, and they say to parents, how do you know these drugs will benefit your children? And they say, here's why, okay? This is the evidence. The problem is, this was not the end of the study. The study continued. And here are the results at the end of three years. I don't know how many of you can read English, but they said this. At the end of three years, being on medication was a marker of deterioration, of doing worse, rather than a marker of benefit. In other words, what happened was this. The kids off medication continued to get better, whereas those who were on medication stopped getting better and got a little bit worse, such that by the end of three years, in fact, the children off medication were doing better. Now, you can go read the study where they reported the three-year results. You can read the abstract. You will not find that result in the abstract. And the reason you won't is because the psychiatrists who were doing the study had two influences operating on them. One, many worked for pharmaceutical companies as speakers, advisors. And second, the American Psychiatric Association, that guild, had promote, been promoting this diagnosis as valid, had been promoting the use of these drugs. So if they highlight this finding, it's going to really question what they've been telling the people, right? But it's in the study, you just have to read it carefully. Here are the six-year results. Medication use was associated with worse ADHD symptoms. The kids are now fidgeting more. And in fact, more oppositional disorder symptoms, that means they're causing more problems in the classroom. And finally, greater overall functional impairment. In other words, in a broad way, the kids on medication were doing worse than the unmedicated kids. So in this study that was designed to see whether we're helping these kids grow up and thrive, the results were negative at three years, the results were negative at six years. Okay, and this is still cited around the world as the best study ever done, but you'll never see the three-year results, you'll never see the six-year results, you'll just see the 14-month results. And I have a question for you all. How many parents of kids who are diagnosed with uh, TDAH in Brazil are told about the three-year results? It's not happening, right? Or the six-year results, it's not happening. And that's my complaint here. If you're going to do this, you have to make all this information known, and then parents can decide whether this is a good thing to do. Now, there were some psychologists who were also investigators on this, and, this, and there was actually a big fight between the psychiatrists and the psychologists. At the end of six years, the psychiatrists did not want to publish this information. They said, let's leave it out. The psychologist said, we have to, and eventually they won. But here's how one psychologist summed up the findings. We have thought the children who were medicated would do better. That did not turn out to be the case. These drugs will help your child behave better over the short term, but not over the long term. And that should be made very clear to all parents. But of course, it is never made clear to parents in the United States or elsewhere. Anyway, let's go forward. Oh yeah, this is, I just put this up. So in the United States, if your child gets diagnosed with ADHD, you go to a website and they say, how do you know you should give the kid stimulants? This is what they say. Look at the 14 month results. They show that it's beneficial for, for your child. Okay, can you see that? Obviously, one of the things I'm talking about here is how information is presented in a society. Um, and when you have sort of a commercial interest at growing a market, and when you get information that really contradicts that growth, what happens to that information? It's not publicized. So let's see if we can find other reviews of the literature. The Canadians did a 
big review of, of, of longer term studies, not a big one, but 14, 1379, one more than 1,000 years, and what did they find? There is little evidence for improved academic performance with stimulants. So that's a, an analysis of 14 studies that at least lasted longer than three months. Now here, um, this group from Oregon looked at all the literature that they could find. More than 2,000 studies. Okay, could they find evidence that this form of care was improving these children's lives over any length of period? And what did they say? There is no good quality evidence on the use of drugs to affect outcomes related to global academic performance, consequences of risky behavior, social achievement. So after 25 years and more than 2,000 studies, he, they could not find evidence for helping the children on these domains, okay? Then Western Australia, the government there, did a 10-year study of children with ADHD. They looked at those who were medicated and those who were not medicated. And the big finding was this. The medicated children were 10 times more likely to be identified by their teachers as doing poorly in school. So in other words, the medicated children were doing worse in school than the unmedicated children at the end of this long-term study. The ADHD symptoms were a little worse in the medicated kids. They had some physical harms, elevated blood pressure. So what did Australia conclude? Medication does not translate into long-term benefits to the child's social and emotional outcomes, school-based performance, or symptom improvement. Again, no domain of improvement, okay? More recently, Quebec had a province, Quebec is a province in, the, in, in Canada. It's a big province. It's a French-speaking uh, province. They're very good up there at collecting data. So what they do is they did a big look at the outcomes for children with ADHD who were medicated and those who were not. And they also looked at what happened in society as they began to medicate more and more of their children. And what these researchers found is it was all negative. It was negative for the society and it was negative for the individuals. So what did they find? They found uh, more unhappiness, a deterioration in relationship with parents among the medicated children. You see that they, there was an increase in children dropping out, doing so poorly in school, they had to repeat the grade. And there also probability that they would get diagnosed with uh, another mental disorder. So what you see in the Quebec study is again negative outcomes on relationships, school performance, all these different domains. So they literally conclude that this increase in Ritalin in their society was a negative for the society as a whole. Now Alan Sroof is a psychologist who began studying, quote, ADHD kids back in the 1970s, even before it was a diagnosis in the, in the textbook. And he finally penned an article in the New York Times. And what does he say? What, do we, what have we learned after 30-some years of doing this? And he says this. Attention deficit drugs increase concentration in the short term, which is why they work so well for college students cramming for exams. You stay up all night and you can do, you know, that's a help. But when given to children over long periods of time, they neither improve school achievement nor reduce behavior problems. To date, after 35 years, no study has found any long-term benefit of these medication on academic performance, peer relationships, behavior problems, the very things we want most to improve. The drugs can also have serious side effects, including stunting growth. I hope what you see here is, this is not me saying this, okay? I'm just a journalist who went through the literature and said, well, what did they find when the researchers studied this question? And after 35 years, this is what they found, okay? Now, unfortunately, this finding really doesn't inform our societal discuss discussions about this. So now, every drug has, you hope that the benefits of a drug outweigh the risks, right? That's the idea, because every drug is going to have potential for adverse effects. 
what we've been talking about so far is what are we finding about on the presumed benefit side of the equation. We didn't find benefit. So now let's look and see what we find on the, the adverse event side of the equation, the risks. And you'll find there's many. There's physical risks, cardiovascular problems, uh, co uh, growth suppression, uh, ticks. Uh, you'll see a lot of OCD behavior, obsessive compulsive behavior. So um, you'll see that we do have deaths in the United States from this. You'll see a lot of depression, apathy. Uh, some children will become psychotic on the drugs. They'll become manic. Uh, and the other problem is this. When you try to go off the drugs, you're going to see all sorts of withdrawal symptoms, more behavioral problems, that sort of thing. So there's a long, a big range of side effects, adverse effects. Now let's go to this, back to this question of animal studies. What are they showing us? You'll see that when you give this to uh, rats during puberty, methylphenidate, it leads to a deficit in sexual behavior as adult rat, and here's what they mean by this. So they give a rat methylphenidate during puberty, right? And then they take away the methylphenidate, the Ritalin, and then they watch that rat as an adult rat. And the males, because they're depressed and anxious, they won't mount the female rats with the same sort of frequency as normal rats, okay? And so when they say, it results in aberrant behavioral adaptations during adulthood. Then they did a similar study in monkeys. Once again, they had the same thing. You give monkeys during puberty methylphenidate for a period of time at the dosage that is appropriate for their weight, and you see they're not normal adult monkeys. Okay, they're anxious, they're depressed, they're less curious. Um, you, and the thought is, by the way, in these studies, that's because you're damaging the dopaminergic system, okay? Here's a summary of them. Adolescent exposure to Ritalin seems to provoke persistent neurobehavioral consequences. Long-term modulation of self-control abilities actually become less able to control themselves. Decreased sensitivity to natural and drug reward, that's a sign that the... Um, dopaminergic system is being damaged, and enhanced stress-induced emotionality, meaning more anxiety, more depression, et cetera, okay? That's just from the animal studies. Now, are you diagnosing your children with bipolar disorder now in, the United, in Brazil? You may not be doing it some, you see? Okay, okay. So, if you go back in the history of bipolar disorder, it was always seen as a disorder of the mature personality. Children did not get bipolar disorder, okay? It began to happen when we began to use stimulants and antidepressants. Prior to that time, you just didn't see the cycling between mania and depression that was used to diagnose bipolar. But you put a kid on a stimulant, and you're going to get some kids who go psychotic. You see this. Uh, in one study, uh, uh, I think it was 6% became psychotic after 21 months. And then this study of 195 children, <coughs> in a study of 195 children who now had a diagnosis of bipolar, they found that 65%, two-thirds, had their first manic or hypomanic reaction after being put on a stimulant. So this is evidence that you're seeing this. Kids go on a stimulant, maybe they have a psychotic reaction or a manic reaction, and then they get diagnosed with bipolar. In other words, it's a gateway to this more severe diagnosis. University of Cincinnati, same thing, about two-thirds of their bipolar patients, uh, for children, had first been hospitalized after going on a stimulant, okay? Now, what I did here was this. These are, these are the known uh, symptoms, or the known changes that you get when you take a stimulant, okay? And these are the arousal stimulants. That's because stimulants means they're arousing you. And then when the stimulant leaves the body, you get these dysphoric symptoms, right? We all know this if you've taken stimulants when you were studying in college, you know this feeling well. So then what I did is I went to the NIMH website. What are the symptoms for diagnosing bipolar? in children. And they said, these are the symptoms. If they have these arousal symptoms, 
and these dysphoric symptoms. And you see how they're exactly the same? The very symptoms that the ADHD causes, this, this roller coaster of emotions where you get up and then you go down, okay, that cycling is what is used to diagnose bipolar. So you can see why stimulants are going to be a gateway to a bipolar diagnosis. In the United States, I do not know in Brazil, somewhere between 12 and 25 percent of children diagnosed with ADHD will convert to bipolar within two to four years. Okay, they'll start as ADHD and then they'll be seen as bipolar. At that point, they're put on uh, much more strong drugs and they're seen as having a lifelong mental illness. So you see what can happen here? You take a child who's fidgety at age five, age six, and next thing you know, they're now got bipolar illness, they have an illness for life. And just to give an example, we had a 40-fold increase in bipolar disorder among youth in the course of seven years, something like that, okay? After, as we began using stimulants more. So, here's just a chart, my effort to sum up the benefits and risks. We did a short-term improvement of ADHD symptoms, okay? We possibly get a 14-month improvement in reading. That's that MTA study. And now harms. No long-term benefit on any domain of functioning. Physical, emotional, and psychiatric adverse effects. That's those adverse effects. Risk of drug-induced conversion to juvenile bipolar disorder. Right? We just talked about that. And then the risk of aberrant behavior in adults. That's that, those rat studies and those animal studies, okay? Now, I believe in informed consent. And this is the information, in my opinion, that a parent should get when they decide whether or not to start putting kids on Ritalin. The kids, of course, do not consent. It's their parents who consent. Now, in the United States, we produce clinical care care guidelines that are written by psychiatrists. These are promoted around the world. All those psychiatrists have ties to pharmaceutical companies, and our guidelines say you should use stimulants right away, okay? Put your ADHD kids on stimulants. But Spanish investigators, <clears throat> and I'm happy to say that these Spanish investigators first became interested in this after they read Anatomy of an Epidemic. They said, is there this information out there? So they did a review of this literature. They went back to see, could this be true? Could what he wrote in this book actually be true? And you'll see they went through it, and what did they conclude? They conclude this. We have carried out an exhaustive review of the sources from scientific evidence regarding the short and long-term effectiveness of the medication. The result is disappointing and should lead to a modification of clinical practice guidelines to the use of drugs as tools of last resort, do other things to help the children in a small number of cases and for limited and short periods of time. They're saying do not use these drugs long term. So at least in, uh, in that country, there is this new idea that the evidence does not support this practice. I'm just curious, what percentage of your children are diagnosed with ADHD today? Any idea? Is it 3%, 4%, do you know? 10%? Diez. Okay, it's muchísimo aquí en Brasil también. En 10%. Bueno, yo creo que va a crecer. Siempre va a crecer. Sí. Bueno, segundo. ¿Y tengo tiempo? ¿Puedo seguir? The, the second, ustedes pueden entender, la traducción está bien, bueno, no estoy de, uh, hablando demasiado rápido, ¿verdad? No. Ok, bien. Now, antidepressants. If you look at antidepressants, uh, before we had the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac and those other modern antidepressants. You have Prozac here, right? You call it Prozac? Before we had a class of antidepressants we called tricyclic antidepressants. Those were the older ones and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And when they tested those drugs on youth for depression, which by the way was seen as very rare before, they didn't work, okay? They did not be placebo. They didn't lift, uh, lift the depression any better than placebo, those older drugs, okay? And you can see this. This is what they're saying. The Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychology, 1992, 
Research studies have not supported the efficacy of these antidepressants in treated depressed adolescents. Now, before we even get into the literature, if you go in the early 1990s and you look at textbooks, they said depression in adolescents and children is rare because mood swings are common in especially adolescents, right? We all know that adolescents can be very moody. Then what happened was this. American psychiatrists who were consulting to the makers of the new antidepressants, Eli Lilly and that group, they began changing their tune. Because in 1992, which is about four years after Prozac comes on the market, you'll see that the makers of these drugs say this, the adult market for these drugs is becoming saturated. Okay, we're getting as many people as possible as adults to use the drugs. Where can we find new markets? And they held congresses and they said, look at these children, they're not taking antidepressants. This is a new market. And once they identified children as a new market, they got American psychiatrists to say, we used to think depression was rare in children. Now we've done these new studies. We find it's frequent. And that mood instability in adolescence is not just a normal thing in adolescence. It is a disease, OK? And they do this in 1994 and 1995. And now having done that, they now are going to test antidepressants in adolescents and children. And what we got in the scientific literature in the late 90s, after they began the testing, was that these drugs were effective in children. They were reducing depression better than placebo, okay? And that they didn't seem to have side effects. And we saw this in study after study. Then finally, what happened was this. In 2002, because there was worry that antidepressants were stirring suicide in youth, our FDA, which is our regulatory authority for medications, said they're going to hold a hearing on the safety and efficacy of these drugs. And here's what they told us. Nearly all the studies in youth had in fact failed. They had not beaten placebo. And in fact, the risk of suicide was double. So why did we have in the scientific literature saying the drugs were effective, while the data sent to the FDA said they're not effective? Well, the reason was the people doing those tests were being paid by the drug companies and they weren't honestly reporting the data in, that was found from the trials, and the trials were biased by design. So, this is an article in The Lancet. The Lancet is a very well-known English journal, a medical journal, one of the premier medical journals of the world, and here's what they said about the testing of antidepressants in children. A, the studies were biased by design, B, the published results didn't square with actual data. That's what I'm just telling you about. The results that appeared in medical journals, when you actually looked at what was sent to the FDA, there was this big gap. Drugs that were not effective were being recast as effective. Adverse events were hidden. You'll see this. Downplays are omitted. This includes suicidal risks were downplayed or admitted. And then, of course, if uh, they were only publishing studies that said they were drugs were favorable, they weren't publishing results saying the drugs didn't work. And look at this final quote about this history of research into antidepressants in children. The story of research into SSRIs in children, childhood depression, is one of confusion, manipulation, and institutional failure. Meaning, our institution of psychiatry failed you all because they told a false story in the scientific literature. And it, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example how bad it is. In one study of Paxil, do you have Paxil here? Maybe a different name, you have Paxil? Paxil, yeah, yeah. In that study in youth, something like 11 of the 90 children given the drug became suicidal. Nobody, in the, or maybe one in the placebo group did. Paxida, ah, yeah. But instead of reporting that the kids were becoming um, suicidal, they reported that a few kids got headaches. So they just omitted this information about suicide. And think about the betrayal here. We're talking about kids' lives, and um, they just didn't report this. And then, I'm getting a bit off here, then there was a big study of Prozac in children 
done by the NIMH, not done by pharmaceutical companies. And that study reported that there was no excess risk of suicide in kids treated with, with antidepressants, okay? That's what they reported. But if you look at the actual data, there were 18 suicide attempts in that trial, 17 were on drug. But they hid that information as well. What I'm trying to say here is, you know, I come from the United States, but one of the problems is so much of the research that informs these practices around the world comes from us. And unfortunately, because of these commercial influences and these guild influences, the information so often that you read in the literature is just not accurate. It's been spun to help support a commercial story. And you'll see, this is actually what the FDA did. 12 of the 15 studies were negative. They actually rejected the applications of the company saying, we want to sell these drugs to kids. These drugs are not safe, et cetera. And the one drug they approved was Prozac, but if you actually look at the Prozac trials, they were very biased by design. What was the British view of antidepressants in children? The regulatory agency there banned the use of these drugs except for Prozac, okay? Said that it's, it's inappropriate. Lancet, these drugs are both ineffective and harmful in children. That was their review of the FDA evidence. And what did the British Medical Journal conclude? Recommending any antidepressant, including Prozac, as a treatment option, let alone as a first-line treatment, would be inappropriate for children, okay? That's in Britain. In the U.S., we give a different message. Now, I hope you see what I'm doing here. This is the benefit side of the equation. Every drug has benefits and risks, okay? Here, even over the short term, the antidepressants were not shown to be beneficial. They didn't reduce depression more than placebo. Meaning, now we just have to look at the risks. We don't have a benefit, but we have the risks. What are the risks of antidepressants in children? You'll see this. There's a lot of physical problems, gastrointestinal problems, sexual dysfunction, and I'll talk about the sexual dysfunction in a bit, akathisia. Akathisia is this inner nervousness that is associated with homicide and suicide. It's a very disturbing thing. Psychosis, mania, panic attacks, anxiety, etc., and a doubling of the risk of suicide. Uh, two things, uh, when we'll get to this. Um, because they have the risk of mania, about 25% of youth in the United States on antidepressants by the end of four years have converted to bipolar. At the end of 10 years on the drugs, 50% have converted to bipolar. Now, the sexual dysfunction is really, I mean, it's tragic, but it's interesting, too, because of what it's revealing. So if you go, if an adult goes on an SSRI antidepressant, uh, somewhere about 60 to 70 percent of people will have some diminishment of sexual function. They, they might have less interest in sex. Um, they may have trouble uh, getting an erection if they're a man, trouble orgasming, or even if they orgasm, they just, they don't care. The, the, the joke that tell, people tell is after having sex on an SSRI, the people will just yawn because they're just not, they're just not able to mount the usual emotional response. So we began medicating our kids, our adolescents, with, um, with these drugs in the 1990s. And then they go to college. And I don't know how it is in Brazil, but there's a lot of sexual activity in our colleges. And so when the kids go to college, the kids that have been on these antidepressants, they want to participate in this sexual activity as well. And they began going to their counselors and asking to come off the antidepressants. And they would come off the antidepressants. But they've now found that about 25% of youth who are put on an antidepressant during puberty, even when they come off, they can't regain normal sexual function. And it's called PSSD, post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. And I, I did a story on them. I interviewed many such people. And what they'll say is, it's not just a sexual dysfunction. They just don't care about anything. 
They don't get excited about music. They don't get excited about uh, you know a rainbow or a sunset or a pretty girl or a, a you know good-looking man. They're just not able to mount an emotional response to the world. You can imagine how upset they are over this. So now there's been nine rat studies trying to figure out what is going on. So if you get a rat, an SSRI, during their puberty years, you know, I think puberty hits a rat at about um, day 45, for about two weeks, take away that SSRI, then watch that rat grow up. They will indeed be impaired in their sexual function. They won't mount. And then if you sacrifice the rat, here's what you find. Their serotonergic system, the number of receptors for serotonin is only about half as normal. So remember, the antidepressant ups serotonergic activity. The drug, 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 as a response, your brain reduces its serotonergic activity. And at least in the animal studies, they're saying maybe this is the reason for this persistent sexual dysfunction, okay? Now let me caution something here. It's not everybody, it's about 25%, all right? which means that maybe in the other 75%, the, the brain is normalizing itself. We don't really know. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and I should have said this at the beginning, this is not a talk that anyone should take as medical advice for themselves. Okay? If you're taking a medication, that's fine. Um, and if you, the evidence is pretty clear that it's difficult to come off. I'm just here as a journalist trying to say, what is the information we as a society should know from the scientific literature, okay? As we as a society decide whether this is a good thing, and whether to use antidepressants in children, et cetera. So please don't take this information as meaning for you, the individual. It's what we as a society should know, okay? So, if these antidepressants can stir manic attacks and psychotic attacks, you should expect a certain percentage will go on to bipolar. I just pulled some information about this. In one, the very first trial of Prozac in kids, 6% had a psychotic reaction and became bipolar. That's the very first study. Yale investigators did a huge study of this involving 80,000 children and adults. That, and they looked at children, people, um, diagnosed either with anxiety or depression and then either treated with drugs or not treated with drugs. And they found that those treated with drugs converted to bipolar at a much higher rate if you had an initial diagnosis of, of depression or anxiety. And it was most notable for kids who were thir in their adolescent years. And you can see why there's already, already this mood instability. So now we've done studies, what percentage of children convert to bipolar given an SSRI, about 25% after four years, and after 10 years, about 50%. So as with the stimulants, you can see that initial treatment with an antidepressant for a mood episode puts you at risk of becoming a permanent mental patient with bipolar. Now, one thing, not all countries are using bipolar diagnosis in the kids. Okay, so this is a problem very specific to the U.S. In the U.K., for example, if you're a child with ADHD, diagnosed with ADHD and you have a, a, a manic reaction or a psychotic reaction, instead of diagnosing that child in the U.K. with bipolar, they diagnose that child with, I forget what it is, uh, I think it's actually autism, autism spectrum disorder now in the U.K., which gives them antipsychotics. It's a different way they're uh, diagnosing this change, okay? But they're seeing the change is the point. So long-term worries, uh, there are some worries that long-term use of antidepressants will lead to a chronic depression, okay? So that's a worry, maybe associated with memory impairment, other cognitive impairments, persistent sexual dysfunction. So if you sum up this evidence base, what do we see with SSRIs in children? We do not see a benefit or we perceive, but we see all these risks, okay? And to my mind, the biggest risk is you're going to change the brain, and we really don't know how that's going to affect the child long term. So this is my attempt to summarize the benefits and the harms. I couldn't find anything on the benefit side. You saw why the FDA said they were not effective even over the short term. And this is just a summary of the different sorts of harms we've been talking about, okay? Uh, just this, I'm going to skip this, but this is just um, 
if you look at the rise of pediatric bipolar in the United States, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, people were saying, bipolar is an illness of the mature personality. It does not happen in children, okay? Then in the 70s, we start getting a few case studies. People said, ah, I'm seeing it in my youth. But it's, you look at those case studies, the children have been put on antidepressants or stimulants, okay? And then the key thing was, this is just where they say we don't find it. This is when they say we're starting to see it. Again, and it's in people who've been treated with these other drugs. And here's how the American psychiatrist handled this thing. So now they're seeing their kids on, bi on stimulants becoming bipolar. Now you might say this is bad for stimulants, right? Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. What the American doctors did, and they did it in this study and in this study, they said, aha, these kids always had bipolar, and by giving them stimulants, we've uncovered the bipolar. So it's actually good these kids got manic, because now we can treat them for the illness they actually all were always had. So there was even talk, it's good to use stimulants as a diagnostic tool in these kids, because those who become manic or psychotic uh, have this underlying illness. Now the problem, of course, is if they're not given the drug, they don't become by, they don't have the manic or psychotic reaction. But that's how they, in their own minds, justified the continued use of stimulants when they were seeing all this bipolar erupting, okay? They said it's uncovering an illness, and that is still said today. If you go to ADHD experts in the United States, they say these children that turn bipolar always had the disease, okay? This is just more information about, if we look at our bipolar kids today, the such a high percentage of them had exposure to stimulants and antidepressants before they became bipolar. The third gateway to bipolar today in the United States is marijuana use. We have kids, we, do, we use a lot of marijuana, and it, it, there's no question that regular marijuana use when you're 15, 16, 17 increases the risk of a, a psychotic or manic episode. Finally, this, so what happens to these kids who turn bipolar? What are their long-term outcomes like? Because now they're going to be treated with mood stabilizers and antipsychotics. And if you look at their condition, their condition is horrible. They become rapid cyclers. They're seen as seriously ill. And then people look at, well, these medications, mood stabilizers, bi bi medications for bipolar in, in kids, these are showing that the long-term outcomes are poor. And then when they review whether the medications, once these kids become rapid cyclers and severely sort of um, have this severe mood instability, do the drugs help them? And now even when they look whether the drugs are reducing that rapid cycling, sort of restoring the mood stability, they're not finding that either. So if you put this whole story together, you take children who are uh, fidgety or get diagnosed with ADHD, or children who have an episode of depression as an adolescent, they move to bipolar, they then develop rapid cycling, severe mood instability, they're given these drugs and they do not find that these drugs reduce this, uh, this uh, se severe uh, cycling, this severe mood instability. So what you really see is, by the way, just so you see this, when uh, an independent firm looked at this, are these drugs helping these children? They said they cannot be recommended for children diagnosed. That's what an independent review said. But what you really see here and I know some of these children personally. I have followed these children. You start with a child who really is, there's not really a problem, and then years later, they're, they're being hospitalized constantly. There's one young boy in the book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. His presenting symptom was he didn't like to sit at the dinner table when called at age four. And he tended to run around the dinner table, okay? And he just wouldn't sit down. It took time to get him to sit down. He was four years old. So he got diagnosed with ADHD. Then he, he, he had a manic episode, and he also developed obsessive compulsive symptoms. He wouldn't go step on the grass, that sort of thing. Then he got diagnosed with bipolar, and then he began using mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, Risperdal. 
then eventually um, he actually started having psychotic symptoms, so they diagnosed him with childhood schizophrenia. He lost control of his bladder on the drugs, and so now he would go to school and he would urinate on himself. You can imagine how popular that made him. He's now, uh, he's now about 12, 13 years old, and he's institutionalized for life. So he cannot be out of the institution. He's now seen as a child with severe schizophrenia. So we went from a kid who was running around too much to this child that is now institutionalized. Now that's a severe case. I will say when he wrote the book, he was just newly diagnosed with bipolar. So it's in five years that this deterioration has happened. And I spoke to a, an outside psychiatrist who's now looking at him in the institution, reviewed his case history and said, this child should, it's all medication. It's, if you go back to him, he was, had every signs of his was normal, et cetera, and now he's just a completely lost child. Now that's not happening to everybody, of course, but it's the risk we're talking about. Atypicals, antipsychotics, if you go back again to the late 1980s, early 1990s, the idea was antipsychotics have adverse effects that are too severe to use in children, okay? Because they cause tardive dyskinesia, Parkinsonian symptoms, so do not use antipsychotics in youth. And you'll we'll see, in 1987, the United States is a big country. I know you're a big country. Our population is more than 300 million, 320. What's the population of Brazil? 150? How much? 200. Okay. But you can see if you have 50,000 youth under age 18 on antipsychotics, it's a small group, and basically this was uh, a small group of kids that were seen as so aggressive they needed to be put on antipsychotics. Today we have more than 1% of all children on antipsychotics. And basically it's poor children, they're being used to control behavior, that sort of thing. And the reason this happened was because, oh, you'll see what they're being used for. Antipsychotics, ADHD, if a kid's too impulsive, not sleeping, they're aggressive, OCD, eating disorders, and this is my favorite. This is a new sort of symptom, I guess. If you don't tolerate when you're frustrated, they'll give them an antipsychotic. Anyway, antipsychotics, by the way, are broad-acting agents. They block a lot of receptors in the brain. They block dopamine receptors, serotonergic receptors, adrenergic receptors. So they are going to really affect your brain. Very broad-acting. What I did here is I just built a chart. These are all the receptors that modern antipsychotics block. By the way, this is a chart from an article published by one of the experts in child psychiatry and psychopharmacology, okay? These are all the adverse events. If you block, for example, dopamine, you're going to get um, Parkinsonian symptoms, weight gains, uh, the boys may grow breasts. That's one of the things that happen with Risperdal. Boys will actually begin lactating uh, when they're 12 and 13. Weight gain, weight gain, blurred vision. So you see there's this wide range of adverse effects. And over here are the effects you can expect to see when you withdraw these children from antipsychotics. And you'll see psychosis, all sorts of things. My point is, if you really look at this, when you give a kid an antipsychotic, Risperdal, Zyprexa, Seroquel, is this what you call them here? Seroquel, I don't know, Abilify, these are the trade names. You're gonna make this kid sick, physically sick. I mean, weight gain, these are all things that, if they were symptoms of a disease, you'd say this child is quite sick. Uh, the other thing that we are now finding out with atypical antipsychotics from animal studies and actually studies in humans is these drugs will actually shrink the size of your brain. So for example, if you give antipsychotics to monkeys, uh, uh, so if you have two groups of monkeys, this group of monkeys doesn't, give, doesn't get antipsychotics, this group gets antipsychotics, and two years later, you sacrifice the monkeys. This group's, their brains will weigh about 10% less. Okay? And they've also done studies that show that as the brain shrinks, you get a, uh, some impairment in cognitive function. Okay? And this shrinkage, by the way, begins to happen within three months. 
This is a study in, uh, in adults, did it in schizophrenia patients, and they found the same shrinkage in, in, in adult schizophrenia patients. Okay, she's saying that the shrinkage is drug related. This is in schizophrenia patients. Here's what she tells the New York Times. This is the former editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry, very famous psychiatrist. What do these drugs do? They block basal ganglia, the prefrontal cortex doesn't get the input it needs and is being shut down. That's the frontal lobes. That reduces psychotic symptoms. It also causes the prefrontal cortex to slowly atrophy. Atrophy means shrink, okay? So again, you have to ask, is this good for a child to give them a drug that will cause this change in the brain? This is just more evidence. We now have 43 studies that show these drugs shrink the brain. Okay, efficacy studies. Why do we use these drugs? They do to prove that uh, these drugs, poor drugs for these different disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and irritability and autism. Now, if you review these literature, these studies lasted between three and eight weeks. In other words, they were very short. They were conducted by the industry. And the point is, did the kids on these antipsychotics seem less irritable. They did after three to eight weeks, okay? That's the evidence for their use, and they were less aggressive. Now, any of you who know antipsychotics, often people will be very uh, slow moving. They'll be sort of emotionally numbed out. So of course they're gonna reduce irritability. Of course they should reduce aggressivity. But you, st and that is the evidence for their use, okay? That change in behavior. We could still ask if it's good for the kid, right? But these drugs will do this. They'll make you more tranquil, slow moving, that sort of thing. We've done one longer term study of antipsychotics for psychotic disorders in children. Only one. So if you look at the literature for the use of antipsychotics, it's short term. Three to eight weeks, not longer term. But this was a study in children who had psychosis, and they were either given uh, Risperdal, Zyprexa, or an older antipsychotic, okay? They were also on other drugs during this, okay? And here were the results. You'll see that they actually did better in terms of responding to their psychosis on the old drug. A greater percentage responded to the old drug. The newer drugs, fewer than half the people even, was, even had a reduction in their psychotic symptoms. Remember, they're antipsychotics, but here's the key thing. So now they start with 116 kids. Only 15, 54 even have a positive response on the target symptom. But now they follow them up for a year. And at the end of one year, only 14 are still able to be on the drug and benefiting from the drug. The others drop out because they start becoming psychotic again. They even get, they get worse in terms of their ability to function, et cetera. So here is what our investigators from this only long-term trial of antipsychotics we have in children, here's what they concluded. Few youths with early onset schizophrenia who are treated with antipsychotic medications for up to a year appear to benefit from their initial treatment choice over the long term. So very few are actually controlling their psychotic symptoms, but now they're experiencing all these adverse events. This is sort of the examples of where we're using atypicals. Oh, no, sorry. This is an example of the many types of um, adverse effects we're seeing. We're seeing tardive dyskinesia. That's where you get these uh, permanent sort of, uh, these, these movement ticks like this, or you'll see the tongue go like, like this all the time. It's a sign that your basal ganglia is becoming dysfunctional. This is this inner agitation that is associated with suicide and violence. Um, we're getting a lot of weight gain. Uh, you're also, we're getting, so we're getting a lot of weight gain, weight gain, diabetes in children. We're getting uh, where the boys are lactating, growing breasts. That's because uh, of abnormal, hormonal problems. You're seeing all sorts of impairment and sort of poor global health. So you're seeing kids on atypical antipsychotics for a number of years really become impaired. They become impaired with their physical health, their cognitive function, their ability to interact, 
We've now been doing this for about 15 years, and the long-term results of kids on antipsychotics is just of kids becoming sick. It's the only way to see it. Tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is sometimes a, uh, it develops. So you'll see this in uh, people with schizophrenia. Then you take away the drug, it often remains, these motor movement problems. The good news is with children, if you remove the drug, the tardive dyskinesia often resolves itself, which is a sign that maybe the youth brain is more neuroplastic and can repair itself. Anyway, I did my usual uh, summary of the research literature. This is the uh, three to eight weeks studies saying we're getting a little bit better reduction in psychosis over three, eight weeks. Autism, uh, less aggressive. Okay, three to eight weeks, and then this is all these harms I'm talking about. They impair uh, numerous transmitters. You get brain shrinkage. You get all these physical problems. Uh, you can see risk of tardive dyskinesia. It's a, it's a long list of harms. By the way, one, one interesting thing, when they tested the drugs in autistic kids, here's how they figured out whether the drugs had adverse effects. Rather than ask the kids, for example, rather than try to search out the adverse effects, say akathisia, the kids had to self-report whether they were experiencing akathisia. So autistic kids, under the design of the study, had to say to their doctors, hey, I'm feeling this nervous inner agitation that's making me feel crazy. Obviously, an autistic kid is not going to self-report uh, akathisia, but that's how they designed the trial to say that these kids weren't suffering from akathisia, okay? Final slide. So, again, we've been, di we began medicating our kids in the 1980s. In 1988, there were 16,200 children in the United States who received a disability payment because they were mentally ill, okay? Now we have about 700,000 children who are receiving a disability payment because they're mentally ill, okay? So this is during this era of diagnosing children, pathologizing children, and medicating children. You see this huge surge in children who are seen as disabled. And if you look at the children who go on disability due to mental illness, when they hit age 18 and become an adult, about two-thirds go on to adult disability. So what, what we're seeing in our country, in the United States, is a new career pathway for our children. Some of them get diagnosed, they get put on medications, they get diagnosed, and by the time they're 18, really what they have is a career as a mental patient laid out before them. So I'll, I'll stop now. Here's the thing when I give this talk on children. Sometimes I can't believe the evidence. I really go over this every time and I say, can this evidence really be this bad? But what you find, you just can't find as you go through the literature, evidence we're helping these kids over the long term grow up and thrive. Instead, what you see time and time again to various degrees is this. Increased functional impairment, that comes up. Poor health, poor physical health, and actually more severe emotional problems and psychiatric problems. That's what you see. And you certainly don't see any improvement in academic achievement. So from my point of view, as this mode of care, this idea we should be medicating children, has been exported from the US to South America, to Europe and now even to Asia. It's a story not of science. It's not a story of medical progress. It's a story of extraordinary uh, commercial success. It's a story of creating markets for products. That's what I think it is. And just for an example, in the United States in 1987, we spent four, $800 million on psychiatric drugs. Any idea what we spend today? Any guesses? $40 billion. So it's a 50-fold increase. The worldwide market now for psychiatric drugs is close to $100 billion. So this is a story, in my opinion, of creating markets for products and of a belief system that was exported from us, the United States, around the world, 
with ideas that are promoted by people that are receiving money from the companies that make the products and also belong to a guild, a profession, who have made drugs their primary product. So anyway, thank you. Obrigado.